Morning Racer here for DragRacing.TV, brought to you by Strutmasters.com. And we've got another quarantine special interview with the one and only Justin Ashley. Justin, man, look, let me dive right into this thing. I know that when you're back there in New York, you are not just living it up high and waiting to step back in the car again. You, in fact, do own a real estate business. You go get your hands dirty. Has the coronavirus matters affected business, or have you been able to tinker away with hammers all along? Yeah, so uh, I own my own fix and plate real estate business uh, based here in New York, and I'm spending this time really adjusting to this new normal, this new normal lifestyle that everyone else is around the world. And for me, it's definitely put things on a little bit of a temporary hold or a temporary pause. We want to make sure that. First and foremost, everyone's safe and everyone's healthy. So some of the building projects that we've had going on, we've had to put on hold for now. Uh, I'm hoping that over the course of the next few weeks, things will start to subside a little and we'll be able to pick them back up a little bit more. Uh, you know, it's definitely taken a little bit of a toll on us, a little bit of a hit, but, you know, we're resilient. We're working from home, doing what we can, and uh, we'll respond. And most importantly, we want to make sure that we're ready to go when things are back to, to relative normal. So, Justin... Even though you've had some interruptions, doing some business from home, trying to make do with how things are going on, as far as entertainment, what are y'all doing as a family? Look, you see the memes out there of the coronavirus, of folks saying, hey, I didn't know my wife until now, and I am about to go wild, and people, you know, dressing up as dinosaurs and roaming the earth. I mean, people, some people are not handling this quarantine that well, so how are you all handling as a family any brand new netflix series or holding the playstation out what have y'all been doing to pass the time it is definitely a unique experience for us my family and i are not ones to just sit around and hang around the house we like to be pretty active and go out and do things so uh it's definitely just an adjustment for us i think that probably the first two or three days it may have wanted to just crawl out the window but uh we've made the best of it we did start a new series on netflix called tiger king which is pretty cool we've been enjoying that but this is the first time I remember since I'm a kid that I actually sat down at the table with my parents and we pulled out a board game. So we played a, uh, a what do you mean board game, had some fun with that, trying to make the best out of the situation. If nothing else, what this does is gives us an opportunity to really look and, and realize how grateful we are for what we have, health, safety, and we have each other. So we have to be grateful for everything. We have to have gratitude and just make the best out of the situation. Things could always be worse. And uh, just doing everything we can, whether it be the board games, whether it be Netflix, whether working from home in our office, just to continue to keep ourselves busy in the meantime. Yeah, man, I definitely think coming out of this, people are going to have some appreciation once again, possibly for family, for home, for hearth, as it were. And I know we're probably going to have a newfound appreciation for being back at the track. The first NHRA national event that's going to be coming up after this coronavirus pandemic, as long as it holds, will be the rerunning or the actual running of the Gator Nationals. Now, I know you won that in the alcohol classes. I'm curious, though, looking at the Gator Nationals further on into the calendar year in June, that's going to be a hot Gator Nationals. What do you think? far as a driver and possibly what you do know of tuning, how challenging the Gator Nationals is gonna be in June. Yeah, I love the Gator Nationals. There's really no race like it. It's one of those premier races that we're fortunate enough to have on the circuit. And we're used to having it in March. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to win there in the alcohol category in 2017 and cars were flying. They were going really fast. And now being that it's moved to June, I'm sure it's gonna be a lot hotter out. It's gonna be stickier out and uh, you know, it's just going to be an adjustment. The bottom line is, yeah, the weather's going to change, but it doesn't just change for us. It changes for all the teams out there. So I think that uh, the track may be a little bit trickier, but I have the utmost confidence that Aaron Brooks and Jason Bunker and Dustin Davis and the boys, they're going to not be too shy and, and be ready to go and, and get after, especially after this long layoff. I know that, uh, you know, they're going to be ready to lay the hammer down and, and go out there and have some fun. Yeah, man, I've been around your guys uh, several races now, and you, I think you got the A team. You got the A team out there. I'm looking forward to that team excelling and becoming a well-known team amongst NHRA fans and the NHRA crews and people recognizing that Davis Motorsports, Justin Ashley Racing, their premier elite guys, and definitely thank you all are on track 
for that. Now, with the NHRA schedule changes, I have to ask, are there any discussions after the announcement yesterday already with the team, or are there any gears rolling to possibly switch from the partial schedule and try to run the full schedule? I mean, right now, I think you're sitting sixth in points. You've been going rounds. You've been performing well with your reaction times. You only have been left on once in all the rounds of competition. So are y'all thinking maybe cobble together some more sponsorship, maybe get a little bit more blood out of the turnip, as it were, and do a full pool? I think that we're always actively looking for sponsorships, and we always want to run the full schedule. Uh, you know, now that NHRA made their announcement and we're down to now 17 more races or 19 total for 2020, it's definitely tempting to want to go out there and figure out a way to be there uh, all 19 races, all the 17 races remaining. But I think that we know that it's really in our best interest. We'd much rather uh, put our resources into a limited schedule and give, our, give ourselves an opportunity to win every time we're at the racetrack than necessarily spread ourselves thin. And that option is always on the table. Uh, it's not going to go anywhere. Looking ahead to 2021, that's something that, uh, you know, we certainly want to do. That's a, that's a goal of ours to have that set up to, to be able to run for, for a championship and compete in the countdown to the championship. But for this season, I think that for right now, anyway, uh, unless anything changes, we're going to continue on our partial schedule. We do have the night under fire race, uh, which is the match race that they hold in Norwalk in August. So that was an uh, additional race for us. And, we're just super excited about that race. That race will be cool. It'll be in front of 50,000 fans. And that, in addition to the other races we're doing on the NHRA schedule, is uh, plenty for us. And uh, more important than anything else, we need to continue to grow and learn as a team. And we'll do that each and every race. Yeah, it's, it's, y'all have an exciting schedule uh, with NHRA, obviously. But, man, that night under fire event at Norwalk, that, that event they have there at Norwalk may be just as big, if not bigger, than the national event that they have. I mean, they burn their billboard down with jet cars. They have John Force come out and still do match racing. And he doesn't do this anymore, but even one time he turned around on the track and came back because the car wouldn't back up after a burnout. Some amazing things happen at night, un- night under fire, and it's – I know you count it as an honor to be a part of it. I know you're looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to being there myself. So if you've never been to Night Under Fire at Norwalk, you definitely need to go and you'll catch this guy there in the influencer top field dragster. And mentioning that, Justin, look, drag cars don't have good names no more. You know, they used to be you know, Coletta's Bounty Hunter. There used to be John Force's Brute Force. There, you know, used to be uh, the Blue Max. And, you know, these, no, no one's got great names anymore. But here you are with a dragster that maybe if some don't know, it's the influencer. That which, that's what y'all have dubbed it. So why that? How'd you come up with it? There's a few different reasons we wanted to come up with the influencer theme. I think first and foremost, uh, you know, it's exciting. It's exciting for this car to have a theme. It's exciting for the fans to be able to attach themselves to a certain car uh, that has its own identity. And uh, it's really dubbed the influencer because it's a, you know, business impact, uh, you know, and our impact on sponsors. Uh, When you're online, when you're on social media, I myself and and we as a team want to be influencers. We want to be able to bring companies on board uh, and influence buyers to make a decision to go with their particular company or, or their particular product. So that's really all where it stems from. And I've got a lot of uh, a lot of people, really a lot of young kids who come up and love the car because they see our icons on the car and they say, oh, I know that icon or, oh, I know this icon. And uh, it resonates with them and it sticks with them. So we've been able to develop a pretty solid fan base from that and people love it. And the, uh, the whole influencer theme has really taken off better than I think we could have even ever expected. I've noticed that, man, and I know it's got to thrill you and your team. The fans definitely are gravitating towards you, your brand, uh, who you are, and you've got great fan interaction. I've noticed that. You're not one of those drivers that just hides themselves off in the lounge. Oftentimes, you're, you know, you're mixing the nitro, you're getting ready, but you'll take time to sign a hero card, to sign a engine part, talk to fans that are old and young, and you see – that growing more and more. I remember last year at the finals, they had you parked really outside of the regular nitro pits. You weren't getting any traffic. And at Pomona and Phoenix, definitely folks were coming around saying, hey, who is this kid that's rocketing down a thousand feet so quickly and so fast and doing a great job? So how's it feel 
to have the fans really be taking you in and saying, hey, this is going to be my guy for the future. Yeah, I think that's really awesome. It's something that uh, I feel privileged to be a part of. For me, uh, it's very humbling. I'm still, want, you know, when people walk up to me and ask me for my autograph, I still, you know, there's a part of me that goes, why? I, I don't understand. You know what I mean? It doesn't, it doesn't really resonate with me yet, but I think it's awesome. I will never be, you know, unappreciative for what the fans bring to the table. They bring so much to the table and they make the NHRA sport what it is, which is so great. I will always make sure uh, that I take the time to, to reach out to the fans, to speak to their fans when they're at our pit area. Uh, they're waiting there. They want an autograph or they just want to talk to me for a few minutes. Uh, that'll be top priority for me. I you know, always try and make sure that I stop what I'm doing to speak with them because they have such a tremendous impact on the sport. And without them, NHRA wouldn't be where they are now. And, and we certainly wouldn't be. So I'm very appreciative for them and, and all the support that they've showed us. So, Justin, you know, whether it was you as a kid going with your dad to the track and his door slammer days or nitro days up to now where you're actually behind uh, the wheel of one of these 11,000 horsepower monsters, look, you've seen it from that side. I have seen it until now recently, really just as a fan following the sport, going to these national events since I was in diapers. And we've just talked about this fan experience. What are some things that you think, you believe the NHRA could do to make it a greater fan experience for those spending their hard-earned money coming to watch y'all race? That's a great question. I think that, you know, right now NHRA does a great job. I think that one of the things that they do really well that separates them from everyone else is their NHRA is a pit pass. Uh, you know, the fans can go there and get up close and personal with the drivers and I mean, if there was any suggestion I would make, it would just be probably uh, to find more ways to make that a priority, uh, to find more ways to get the fans involved with the teams, involved with the drivers, because at the end of the day, uh, the fans make the sport roll, and, and they need to have not only a connection from seeing people on television, but they need to have an emotional connection to these drivers. So in order to do that, they need to spend time with them. They need to be up close and personal. And and as I mentioned, the NHRA does do a good job of that right now, but I think that any way that we can find a way to improve in that category would be very beneficial. Great, Ashley. Good point. Now, you and you've we've talked about the fans here. Obviously, some of your biggest fans really are your partners, like strutmasters.com and Auto Shocker. Talk to me about the sponsors you've got that you've cobbled together, how you have done that. I mean, you don't have just one primary sponsor. You've got several names on board making this program possible and recently added another name, a Hero Soap Company. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, it's, it's always, you know, winning on the racetrack is one thing, and that's a priority for us. But at the end of the day, we wouldn't be there and we wouldn't have the opportunity to race without our sponsors. And for us, they're more than sponsors. They're marketing partners and, and they're members of the team, to be honest with you. And, First of all, you know, Chip Lofton and, and Strut Masters, they were the ones who put their best foot forward to help get me in this position. Without Chip and without Strut Masters, I would not be able to do what I'm doing right now. So he's been just a tremendous help for me. Uh, but we have other marketing port partners on board like Auto Shocker, like Cotto Fastening Systems, and like this wonderful company, Hero Soap Company, that we brought on board. And I think one of the amazing things about them is that they are veteran-owned and operated and they donate a portion of their sales to the military, to the firemen, to the police. So it's more than just buying soap. It's buying soap and helping it cause, not to mention that the product itself happens to be really good. Uh, I use it all the time. So I think that, uh, you know, we also have Lucas Oil, King Bearings, the list goes on and on, but uh, Justice Brothers, it's just, I feel that they are more than sponsors. They're marketing partners, and our top priority is to make sure that they are part of the team, but that they receive their return on investment that they deserve. And we'll make sure that that always comes first above all else. You've got some great partners and partners that span the range of the automotive industry. You know, strutmasters.com with air ride suspensions and air ride conversion kits, auto shocker with really interior matters, and then all the way out to, well, the exterior of our bodies with Hero Soap Company. Uh, by the way, folks, if you use promo code MMR, it's 10% off Hero Soap Company. And Justin, what's your plug you've got going on with Hero Soap Company? I do, so I have a promo code as well. 
Uh, the promo code is Justin Ashley Racing. So if you use that promo code, Justin Ashley Racing, you get 10% off. There you go, folks. Get clean and stay clean, which is very important right now during this coronavirus pandemic. Well, Justin, look, we've talked about fans and partners. I'm sure that you're a fan as well of drag racing. You wouldn't be out there racing. And I'm sure one of the folks out there that has to be one of your number one heroes is your dad. So talk to me. What was it like growing up, going to the races, being a part of racing so intimately and seeing your dad's career go through the shifts and changes that it went through? I learned so much from watching my dad grow up, uh, or when I was growing up, rather. When I was at the racetrack, uh, not, nothing else mattered to me. I just wanted to be there, and I followed his every move. Wherever he went, I was that little kid following him around, uh, just trying to learn from him and watch him. And I knew that one day I wanted to be able to do what he did. And I, I just watched some of the ups and watched some of the downs and how he responded to them. And I try and take a lot of what he applied when he was racing, not only on the track, but off the track with marketing partners and just the way he lived his life and approached every day. And I do my best to try and apply that to my life right now today. And I mean, the lessons are just countless and they go on and on. But that experience growing up, watching my dad race Pro Modified, uh, race funny car. It's just, there's nothing like it. And those are memories that I'll cherish forever and I'll never be able to replace them. And uh, I think it is important because I learned how to be a better driver doing that. But more importantly, I learned how to be a better person. With just about any man, they have looked to their dad at some point in their lives. They've had them as a hero, just as you've mentioned. And, you know, my dad has been my own personal hero at points in my life. Let me ask, though, who else in the drag racing world has been a hero to you? You know, for me, I can remember thinking Bob Glidden was so great. I can remember uh, thinking Kenny Bernstein was great. So who for you was a hero that was not within the family? So I think that there's a bunch of really great guys that I was fortunate enough to be surrounded with. But one guy in particular, and I know this is probably no surprise, but is Antron Brown. Uh, you know, the heroes that I look up to are the guys that are not only successful on the track, but it's their impact that they have on, uh, you know, the lives of others off the track. And I think that Antron Brown is just uh, the consummate professional. I think that he does a great job representing his sponsors on and off the racetrack. In my opinion, he's, you know, one of the best drivers, if not the best driver to ever do it uh, when he's behind the when he's behind the wheels. So he's a guy that I look up to. Uh, I try and model my career after I try and model my life after. And I was fortunate enough for the first time to be able to line up against them in eliminations uh, this past race in Arizona. So just doing that in and of itself kind of shows how things have come full circle because I went from watching him drive when I was a kid and wanting his autograph to, to lining up against him. So just a privilege and an honor to be able to race against a guy like that because of the job he does as a driver and because of the person he is. So with that relationship that you two have, because you've licensed in his car in the past, and you're actually running an old Antron Brown car from Don Schumacher Racing. So I've got to ask, with the relationship you've got, what did y'all say before the round there in Phoenix? Because I can remember, I remember y'all lining up. I'm like, oh, this is big. This is big for Justin. I know Antron is trying to run better and really turn around from 2019, which wasn't that great of a year for him. Y'all had run your best times ever as a team, and – I was hoping you'd take Antron down. So tell me, me too. What, what was said before and after? Was it just professional? Was it lighthearted? What was going on? Yeah, I think it was more professional and lighthearted than anything else. And I, you know, make no mistake about it. We're there to win. But if we're going to lose, I'd rather lose the family. And I consider Antron and Mark Oswald, Brad Mason, Brian Crotty, all the guys on their team over there to be family. So we definitely lined up with the intention of uh, crossing the finish line first. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. But I was happy for Antron and, uh, you know, I think just before the race and after the race, we just spoke a little bit about, uh, you know, how, you know, happy we were to just be in a position. We said that hopefully next time we race, it'll be in a final round instead, instead of the quarterfinals. But, uh, you know, I got out of the car at the top end, made sure that I went over there, you know, we gave each other a big hug and just congratulated him and, uh, you know, on advancing to the next round. And we spoke for, for quite, quite a bit. Uh, just really, I think more so than anything else, just complimenting each other. He had a lot of really great things to say about me. And, and obviously I had a ton of great things to say about him. He knows how I feel about him. And uh, yeah, that was, that was fun. Uh, you know, anytime you get to line up against, against Antron Brown, definitely a privilege for us. And I look forward to the next time. 
Justin, so recently I've interviewed Tricky Ricky Smith, Matt and Angie Smith. Matt and Ricky have had some starting line shenanigans in their career, especially Ricky Smith. Now, in the fuel classes, unlike Pro Stock, Pro Stock Motorcycle, there's not much room for you all to play around. But you right now have established yourself as one of the better levers in the nitro fuel ranks. I've got to ask, what do you do to prepare for those exceptional good lights? And what are your thoughts on deep staging, on holding that stage light as long as possible, the classic burn down and in fuel? What, what's your thought on the games that can happen on the line? As a fan, I think the games are awesome. <laughs> I think they're a lot of fun to watch, and I think that it brings value to the sport. And, uh, you know, it just shows that the rivalries and the, and the true competitiveness and, and the will for people to win, and they're willing to do whatever it takes within the rules to make that happen. And, you know, I, I definitely understand that part of it. However, that's not me. I don't think I'll ever be that guy. Uh, you know, whether you want to stage deep or whether you want to stage shallow is one thing. My preference is just to stage shallow. That's just because, you know, what I prefer but it really just depends on who you are as a driver. And in terms of preparation, I really just go up there and just try and keep things as simple as possible. I try and do the same thing every time I'm up there and be as robotic in my pro approach as I can. And that's something that my father taught me from a young age. And it's something that I learned from going to Frank Hawley's drag racing school is just to, to be you and to never change and never waver. And for me, that means I don't get up for a particular guy I don't, I don't try and take it easy for a particular guy. If it were up to me, it would, you know, I wouldn't even know who's in the other lane and it'd be the same as a test session. So I just try and see the light and go keep everything as simple and robotic as possible. I think that's a good avenue to go instead of getting all riled up on who is in the other lane and doing your thing. And, and man, look, talk to me again about first round at Phoenix. Maybe not everyone knows about it, Y'all are thrashing in the pits. I was there standing, and I'm like, oh, no, because y'all had qualified so well, and it was go time, and y'all were not ready to go with the mishaps that had happened with the electronics. But you hopped in that thing, and you cut a stellar light in one round one. So how did y'all handle that? How did you get through that? Not just you, but what did you see as a driver getting everything on in the pits instead of the staging lanes? that you saw from your crew, the Davis Motorsports gang, acting all professional and getting the job done. Yeah, that's something that you never want to have to go through. But in the end, you're probably better off having gone through it because our team definitely uh, grew a lot from that experience. What happened was before the first round in, in Phoenix, we had qualified better than we had ever qualified before. We ran a 370, qualified fifth. Everything was, was great. Sunday morning, about an hour before first round, we went to warm up the car and there was an electrical issue in the car that we just could not get figured out. We basically went by process of elimination and got down to the last possible option. And uh, we were able to figure out what it was, but everything just took so long to try and figure it out. And the guys were thrashing, moving so incredibly quick and doing such a good job to make sure that we even rolled the car up to the starting line. And at that point, it's like, oh, you know, I hope everything's going to work. I hope we're able to get the car started. It's going to go down the track. So we were able to get the car out. We pulled the car out of the pits at 12, uh, 11, 10, maybe 10 58 when first round was at 11 or something like that. And they were singing the national anthem as we were pulling out. So we were uh, just a few pairs back and we rolled up literally in the nick of time and rolled up next to Scott Palmer. And it's just a testament to our group of guys. They really did a great job for me. I'm just sitting in the car. I'm not working on the car. I'm not thrashing on the car like those guys are. It's up to me when I get the starting line to be able to do my job and help give us an opportunity to win. But without the job that they did to be able to get that car ready to go, that would have never been a possibility. So it's just a testament to the group, a testament to the whole Davis Motorsports team, Aaron Brooks and the guys. Uh, we were able to go up there and run a 372 and, uh, and advance to the next round. And I think <laughs> it was definitely a little bit of a gut punch and, and it's just a learning experience. And uh, I was able to kind of just put everything behind us once we, once we started the car and, and we'll use it as a learning experience going forward and, and it'll only help us from this point on. Well, y'all definitely got past the side quest of thrash and overcame <laughs> it and won that round one uh, victory there at the Arizona Nationals. 
Now, you've got a similar situation with Matt Smith, and I want to ask you. So, Matt Smith, here he is. He's the fastest man on pro stock motorcycle bikes. But his dad is Mr. Dorkar, basically. <laughs> and here you are. You have been in a rail, it seems like, your whole driving career from juniors to top dragster, alcohol, now nitro. I mean, does dad ever say or ask when you're going to hop in a door car? I think that uh, I get that question asked to me all the time. At least when I'm at a racetrack, I get asked at least once or twice from people, hey, Justin, when are you going to race a pro mod? Hey, Justin, when are you going to race a pro mod? So right now, I got to figure out what the heck I'm doing in the top fuel car first, and then we can talk about it later. But uh, my, my, you know, I think I, I would never want to say no to anything. I would love to drive any kind of car, especially pro mod. Pro mod will always have a soft spot in my heart uh, be just from growing up around the sport. I would love to drive a pro mod, but I need to figure out what I'm doing in top fuel first before I could even go any further than that. Uh, you know, all my 100% effort, commitment, and time is to this team and to racing uh, in this top fuel car. And I think part of what makes this so great and, and so enjoyable is not only do I love the top fuel class, not only do I love winning rounds and going rounds and enjoying the whole experience, but I enjoy the people that I'm doing it with. Because if I didn't, then it really wouldn't be worth it at the end of the day. So I'm having a good time. I'm enjoying myself. 100% committed into what we're doing right now with this top fuel ride and these Davis Motorsports guys. And, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Yes, sir. You've got a great group of guys. Love hanging around them myself. Tell me, of the gang that is Motor Davis Motorsports, who's the guy out there that's like the class, class, class clown? Who's the guy out there that is the motivator that keeps everybody together? Who's Mr. Serious? You know, who are the characters of Davis Motorsports that really stand out? I think we have a, an interesting cast of characters, that's for sure. Everyone has their own different types of personalities, and that's what makes it fun. I think, first and foremost, everything stops, starts from uh, top to bottom, and it starts with Dustin Davis. And, uh, you know, he's the owner of the team and uh, co-owners, co but he runs the day-to-day -day operations of the team. Make no mistake about it. His heart and soul is into this team more so than anything else. And, uh, you know, he's disciplined. He works harder than anybody I've ever seen work before. And that says a lot. He will grind. He will have sleepless nights to make sure that, this car is ready to go and he's just extremely committed. And, you know, he's the guy that I think the go-to guy that we all look to, uh, you know, for some guidance that, that we can lean on and, 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 and try and see what he does and emulate ourselves after. Now, in terms of a class clown or a team clown, if you will, there's a lot of, a lot of really funny guys on the team. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, Jason Bunker is one of those guys who has kind of a, a, a dry sense of humor, if you will, that is just a really enjoyable guy to be around. So, He'll always say things and he's always very lighthearted and make me laugh. He's a guy that uh, will help strap me into the car. And I'm not sure how other drivers are. I can't, I can't speak to that, but uh, we're usually pretty lighthearted when he's belting me in, just making jokes and laughing about things. So he's definitely a guy who, uh, who keeps things lighthearted and funny around the pits. Awesome. Yeah. You've got a great group and you yourself being a great young man, you have uh, definitely, uh, fitted in there just right in that Davis Motorsports gang. So, Justin, look, during this time of the coronavirus pandemic, I've been looking back to a lot of old races and been enjoying watching old races. And i got to ask you, what is one of your favorite moments ever in drag racing history that you look back that you kind of keep resounding and, you know, gives you thrills every time you think about it or see it on TV? What's an old drag racing moment that you love? This might be a little bit of a cop out, but the 2007 Indy race when my dad won Indian Funny Car is one that I always look at and be like, man, when I was a little kid watching him do that, I was like, dad, how'd you do that? You know, so even looking back at, at it now, uh, you know, that's my all-time favorite race. That beats anything. It doesn't even come close to anything else. But uh, just as a pure fan of the sport, unbiased opinion, uh, I think what they call the run. Uh, by Tony Schumacher. It was at 2006, I think. Am I right in saying that? Around that area. I cannot remember yeah. either. In Pomona, where he had to not only win the race, but he had to run like, and I don't even know the specifics of it, but between like, like no faster than a 441 and no slower than a 443. And he went out there, won the race around a 442 and won the championship. So that to me is like the ultimate check me out moment. Uh, final round at Pomona. Uh, you know, under the lights at night. It was just a spectacular moment. I completely agree. I 
eventually I'm going to have on my YouTube channel a top 10 you need to watch this during the pandemic races and that was originally going to be one of the races but it's not really out there on youtube shame nhra get a great moment like that out there on your youtube channel but yeah that run the run of schumacher having to set a record having to win the race and doing it over who was leading the points at that very moment Doug Coletta, that, that's one of the top moments definitely in drag racing so justin look You've been in a nitro fuel car, in alcohol, junior dragsters. Your dad's been around the door cars and the pro mods. I'm curious. Drag racers are often thought of as being, well, crazy. How in the world do you strap yourself into a car that goes over 300 miles per hour? From your standpoint, though, obviously thinking that it's sane because you're doing it, who do you think in the motorsports world in the other types of motorsports that there are, that they are, in fact, the crazy ones? Huh. That's a great question. And, and you're right, people do think we're crazy for doing what we do. But for us, it's just kind of another day, I guess, another day at the office. But one thing I'll say is that when we go to Las Vegas and we see the, the fighter pilots and the fighter jets fly over because there's a base right there next to the track, that's when I look at those guys and say, I wonder if they think we're crazy because I think they are nuts. They have to be out of their mind to be able to do what they do. They uh, are going extremely fast at extremely high speeds. Uh, the G-forces are just unreal. And uh, I know that some of the NHRA drivers have had the opportunity to go sit with them uh, in the planes. Uh, you know, maybe one day that'll be in the cards for me. But I just look at them and think, wow, that's pretty incredible what they're doing. They must be kind of nuts to be able to do that. Definitely. And I mean, would you take up that opportunity or do you think in that moment that you, you might check it out? I would have to. It'd be too good of an opportunity. I'd be scared. I'll say it right now. I'd be scared. It'd be too good of an opportunity for me to pass up. I'd love to do it. Puke bag ready, but you're doing it. Oh, it's ready. Puke bag is ready. I'm going to have to have some water ready because I might pass out, but I'm doing it. Make no mistake. I'm doing it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's do some dreaming here, man. You are in your rookie season though you had a few races last year and look i'm calling it you're 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 going to be the rookie of the year in top field i firmly believe that i'm calling it and everybody remember i've been saying it for a while <laughs> monday morning racer is calling it. this man justin ashley is rookie of the year in top fuel but honestly let's do some dreaming where do you hope it all goes i mean is it catch tony schumacher is it be the fastest top field driver ever is it to get some quarter mile races in to experience the full 1320 in a nitro car what does justin ashley dream about for his career in a top fielder i want to race and i want to race for a long time very successfully uh, that's what it comes down to i love racing very few things uh in this world uh, you know make me happier than racing and i want to make sure that i put myself in a position to be able to do that for the next 25 30 years. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that that's, that's step one is to, to be able to uh, make sure that I'm out there, but I want to do it successfully. I want to give myself and my team an opportunity to win every time we hit the racetrack. And it's as simple as that. I, you know, I want to win multiple championships. I, I you know, I want to do everything it takes to be successful. And I know sitting here, I'm a rookie. I don't even know, uh, you know, I appreciate the kind words, but I don't know that I'm going to win rookie of the year. There's a lot of stiff competition out there and I have to stay in my own lane and do my job. We've had a few good races, but uh, we've also had some humbling experiences so far. So step one, let's take care of this year. Uh, our goal is to definitely win Rookie of the Year, but yeah, I want to be great. I think that's the purpose of why we're out there. Uh, I don't care if I'm playing ping pong. I don't care if it's the fix and flip real estate business, if it's racing. I want to be great, period. And I want to win, period. I want to win racing. I want to win championships. So I think for me, that's, that's going to be a dream of mine to, to race, to race successfully for the next 25, 30 years. Good answer there, man. That's stellar. And I think you definitely have got yourself set up to have a great career with longevity. Now, you mentioned ping pong there. So, well, look, give me the rundown, man. What are some hobbies there at the house when you're not driving, when you're not doing the and fix it and flip it type deal with the real estate? What are the hobbies that Justin Ashley enjoys? I think one of the new hobbies that I've picked up on <laughs> just from this whole uh, quarantine period of time is playing Scrabble. <laughs> I've played Scrabble with my girlfriend now for. Uh, can't imagine how many times over these last few days just to kind of keep ourselves busy. But generally speaking, I love sports. Obviously, there's no sports going on right now in the world, but I played football for my whole life growing up, and football always has a 
a uh, big place in my heart. I was fortunate enough to, to walk on and play Division three college football. So uh, football, baseball, basketball, uh, I love to play sports more so than, than probably anything else. So that's where my hobbies lie. And in the, in the summertime, I like to get out on the water, whether it's on a boat or a jet ski and uh, spend some time doing that. But as long as I'm active doing something, it's, it's when I'm sitting still that, that I got some issues. So I got to make sure I'm doing something to keep myself busy. Well, man, dive into that. What college did you play for? What position in football? Yeah, I went to Ithaca College, which is a uh, small Division three school in upstate New York. I went there. Uh, Division three has no scholarships, but uh, I was a walk-on, meaning that I had no guaranteed spot on the team. Uh, but I was able to go in there and try out and make the team. So I played there for three years. That was a great experience for me. And I uh, love football. Always love football. I'm a Jet fan. Uh, really big Jet fan. Sometimes it's really hard for me to take. It's not an easy lifestyle to live, but <laughs> I've gotten used to it over the course of time. We're trending in the right direction. No, you're not. I'm sorry. <laughs> God bless the Jets. I mean, ever since Joe Namath, it just, oh, I mean, it hasn't been I mean your team is more well known for the butt fumble than their Super Bowl, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What are you going to do? Listen, hey, it, it keeps me, I'm pat, there's no doubt, I'm so passionate about the Jets that they've taken years off my life. Let me put it that way, just from the stress and the anger. But nonetheless, once you're a fan, you're fully invested. That's it. There's no turning back. Well, folks, here you have it. Justin Ashley is less stressed in a top fueler at 300 miles per hour than he is watching his New York Jets on an NFL Sunday. Justin, look, where can folks find you? You're in the influencer top field dragster. Where can they find you on social media? Hit those plugs. Yeah, so I have an Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Those are the best places to reach me. I also have a website, justinashley.com, but use at the Justin Ashley to be able to contact me and reach me. And one of the things I take pride in is just interaction with the fans. So if you ever want to message me or comment on some posts, uh, it's definitely an interactive experience. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at the Justin Ashley, and uh, go on there and take a look. Well, folks, this has been Justin Ashley. I'm the Monday Morning Racer here for DragRacing.TV, brought to you by Strutmasters.com. Justin, look, give those last words for your fans, partners, and your competitors. <laughs> stay safe. That's what I want to say right now in this unique period of time. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Looking forward to seeing everybody back at the track soon. We're going to be racing soon. This will all be behind us. Uh, let's make sure that we continue to move forward, continue to help each other, be there for each other, and uh, do what we can to put this in the rearview mirror. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Lee, for doing this interview. Uh, one last thing, follow Monday Morning Racer. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, man. I appreciate that plug. And folks, keep an eye on Justin. Keep an eye on Monday Morning Racer and DragRacing.tv. Me and Justin's been talking. We've got some plans for some interactive and good entertaining stuff for the NHRA season, season whenever we get back out. Yeah, right. Um, Justin Ashley, Monday Morning Racer, DragRacing.tv, brought to you by the experts in suspension, Strutmasters.com. Oh, 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 oh